it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode 30 of our podcast, Can You Believe It?, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton, but most importantly, We hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too, don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Caramel. 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 (laughs) We're stuck on caramel. It's delicious. So if you're a fan of delicious coffee, the best scones around, and great lunchtime favorites, then head on over to Coffee Coffee. You will not be disappointed. Okay, so what a day today has been. What a day. That's all I can say. It's been an interesting day. I wake up with an elementary school daughter and no longer an elementary no, she's school. off to college. She's off to middle school. You could not give me a million dollars to go back to middle oh, school. Oh, hell no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. We will not go back. Uh-uh. Nope. So we go to graduation, basically. Now, I don't have a baby that's in elementary school. I'm going to middle school. We go to lunch with friends. We come home, and then I'm like, okay, we're going to record. Holly Ann's coming over. Open up my phone. My neighborhood has a Facebook page <laughs> yeah. that's just for our neighborhood. Uh-huh. And we don't have that many houses, maybe 25, 30 tops. Right. And it says a neighbor posted in the neighborhood page. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it says, this just happened within the last 15 minutes. Everyone be careful. So I look at the picture, and I'm like, that's my house. <laughs> okay. It is actually a very funny story that they did that. But I have two questions here. <laughs> okay. The first is, why didn't they knock on your door and tell you that the tree had fallen down? I don't know. The second is, be careful. What? Is the tree going to jump up <laughs> off the ground and get them? I mean, it's a, it's not even a two-lane road right there. The speed so, limit is 20. It is. But the problem is, the tree was then blocking the entire road, basically. What are people going to drive? I just, I don't understand the be careful part. Are people well, going to drive into the tree? I guess if there's another tree coming down. <laughs> <laughs> so I open it up, look at the picture, and of course I'm like, man, that's my tree. <laughs> yep. So the other part of the good story is Joe is away for work. Yes. So I'm like, oh man, this is not good. Right? It's a tree that spans the whole road. It's down. People can't really get by. And it's just the girls and I. And so what did you do? I called my friend Ryan and I'm like, I need you to come over here with the chainsaw. <laughs> And he did. They actually got it out of here pretty quickly. Yeah. Ryan and his dad, Mr. Jerry, I just want to say thank you again for the immense amount of help. Now the neighborhood can leave and go as they would have wished. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> because I would not have been able to do that without them. Yeah. Well, Mr. Jerry, he was being funny. He was fooling around and he offered me the chainsaw and I was like, I'll take it. I know my way around a chainsaw. <laughs> I don't know my way around a chainsaw. I've done some cutting. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you to you guys for helping me out today. Yeah, that was actually great. It went by very quickly. I mean, they got everything out of there quickly. Yeah, it did. And now it's just on the side. Mm-hmm. So when Joe comes back tomorrow from Florida, he has a giant pile of wood. A tree. Yay. <laughs> he should split some of that, make you some live edge chicken coop. Yeah. So how are you doing? I'm fine. So you made a cake for today. Are we going to tell the story? <laughs> I made a cake for today. And- <laughs> well, my bad story, your bad story, but they're funny. Yeah. Well, I have an Australian shepherd named River. We talk about River sometimes. Yes. Oh, River, yes. No, I, I have to say that River, we are his fifth house. But he is the sweetest guy. He's the sweetest dog. We absolutely love him. He's the sweetest dog. But again, we're his fifth stop. Yes. We all know why. <laughs> well, he was actually the product of a divorce to begin with. Yeah. But River has one little issue. <laughs> yes. He's a food ninja. <laughs> he is. Oh, that's an understatement. It really is. I mean, he will sneak by and get food. I can't even put it into words. Long story short, it was pouring rain today. I heard the pullets. We can't put the pullets outside. Yeah. Pouring rain. I heard them downstairs fussing. So I just ran downstairs to see what was going on. While I was downstairs, <laughs> River helped himself to the carton of shortening that was on the counter that I was about to make icing with for our 10,000 download cake. Woohoo! <laughs> and what ensued, I'm ashamed that I took part in it. <laughs> <laughs> There was, there was short. Was there a chase? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a chase in several, <laughs> several directions, and there was shortening all over my house. And yeah, the food ninja. I mean, he strikes all the time. Oh, he's something. I, I think every time I'm at your house, he strikes. 
It's the only thing I can say negative about him. Otherwise, he is the sweetest he dog. He is. And he loves snuggling with the girls. He does. But he also loves taking food right he from them. He will just bold face mug you. I mean, he will just take the food right the from best you. was <laughs> when the babies got to your house. She means our chicks this year. Yeah. yeah. Then we came later that evening to pick them up. <laughs> And we're all down with the babies and we come up and here comes River around the corner with the fake ceramic eggs. Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah, I was afraid he'd break a tooth on that. I, I know. Yeah. No, I got those away from him. Or the time he took the eggnog glass directly. <sighs> it's hilarious. He's big for an Aussie and he really can take stuff like straight out of the sink. He did. He wanted that eggnog so bad. Oh, for so sake. we'll just say that it's been an eventful day. Yeah. But we're laughing. And Vega, thank you to my husband for cleaning up the shortening that was all over the house. Oh, my God. Let's move on. We want to take just a second to say, if you're listening to us on Apple and you're loving this podcast, can you please leave us a written review? That would be amazing. It actually helps us grow further on the charts. It does. Apple kind of runs the podcast world. Yeah. They really do. And written reviews are an enormous part of what they yeah. look for for you to be able to grow as a podcast. So if you're loving our podcast, just a few words would help. And we would really greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Does everyone out there know what a Patreon page is? I don't know. A Patreon page is a page set up by a podcast or an artist where you can go and become a patron of the show. Yes. And basically, we have a three-tier level mm -hmm. of where you can join. You can pay $1 a month, and the $1 a month goes to show that you like the show and that you want to support us. You can pay $3 a month. Yes. And we give a bonus episode every month. It's good stuff, too. I really it's, like our bonus episodes. It's really great stuff. Mm -hmm. It's an extra bonus episode. And then if you pay $5 a month, you get the bonus episodes. Uh-huh. Plus. And you get a monthly happy hour Zoom call with us. Yes. Which is generally a lot of fun. It's so much fun. Yeah. Patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. And join us for all the fun. Okay. Okay. So now let's move on to. Ta-da. Breed Spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and that introduction is for the brown shaver. The brown shaver. My question is, did the brown shaver shave its legs? <laughs> no. <laughs> I will tell you this. This is more correctly called the shaver brown. Okay. This is sort of a New Zealand themed episode. This is a really fun episode, and this chicken is part of the New Zealand lifestyle. Yeah, apparently it's a very common chicken there. It is called the brown shaver there. There's a whole set of shaver chickens. Yes, there's red, mm -hmm. and there's brown. And there's a black. And there's a black shaver. And there's a white. And a white. And we're going shaver crazy today. Shaver crazy. If you haven't guessed, we're going to be talking about New Zealand today. Right. And this breed of chicken, the high popularity in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first thing they know is that the shavers are not a breed. They won't breed true. They're a hybrid. Exactly. They're a sex-linked hybrid that was developed in Canada. One of the only two chickens developed in Canada. So these were some of the earliest hybrids that were developed, and it was for maximum egg-laying ability. They wanted a backyard chicken that would present as an industrial chicken. And it ended up being an industrial chicken. So let's just look at these numbers. 300 eggs per year. Right. Now, that number is for the first year. First it's year. an incredible number of eggs. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I found out is that they decrease in the number of eggs every year that they will lay. Uh-huh. So let's give them some examples of other hybrids just while we're talking about it. Isa Browns. Golden Comets. Chickens like that will lay for you every day. They're bred to lay and lay, lay, lay. They're not bred to have a long lifespan. Exactly. But the key thing about this chicken is it's a hybrid, but it's bred that every year it's going to decrease. So what it does is it gives it a little bit more longevity. Right. Their lifespan is six to eight years, which is extremely long for a hybrid for chicken. Hybrid, it really is. And they still lay an incredible amount of eggs. You can find the shavers worldwide. As we said, the brown is most common in New Zealand. The shavers were developed by a man named Donald Shaver. Donald Shaver. He's considered a pioneer in hybrid chicken breeds in the 20th century. Because like we were saying, this chicken is an earlier hybrid. Yes, very early. Shaver had a hobby breeding business that he started in 1932 when his great aunt gifted him with a pair of chickens. Okay. 
He eventually became an enthusiastic hobby breeder. He started bicycling to poultry conferences, and he just worked and worked with his chickens. In 1935, his Leghorns won a Canadian National Egg Laying Contest. Wow. So he was really into the chickens. And it sounds like he was really into chickens laying a lot of eggs. Yeah. I think his interest was definitely with the layers. But Shaver's poultry business was put on hold when he went off to fight in World War II. Okay. He returned from the war having seen poverty and starvation. Right. He was in Europe for most of the war. So he saw all these really terrible things. And he came home with an interest in mass producing food. So here we go. Let's let's get a chicken that's going to lay exactly. you an egg every, almost every single day. And so what he worked to develop were chickens that fit industrial standards of mass production. From the 1950s to the late 80s, Shaver hybrids held a chunk of the industrial egg market. It, it was a good amount. I don't think it was here, though. It eventually grew to be in the U.S. as well, but it, it was definitely global. Yeah. So Shaver spent the rest of his life working on his hybrids. Before his death, he was named an officer of the Order of Canada Okay, for his work in poultry genetics, and he was awarded three honorary PhDs from Canadian universities. And that's where you may hear Dr. Shaver. Right. Honorary PhD does not confer a doctorate on you. No. You're not You have a to work for a doctorate. Exactly. You have to do the work. It's paying tribute to you for work you've done throughout your lifetime, but it's not the same as having a PhD or an MD. So if someone looks it up, they may see Dr. Dr. Shaver, Shaver right, and that right. is where it comes mm-hmm. from. So Donald Shaver was inducted into both the American Poultry and the International Poultry Halls of Fame. I did not know those existed. <laughs> That's what our wonderful editor Pete said to me this morning. He said, there's a Hall of Fame for poultry. Can we go in the Hall of Fame at some point in life when we're like 90? Goals. Goals. Life goals. Life goals. <laughs> So the Shaver Company still exists. It's actually been sold several times through the years. And right now it's currently a part of Hendrix Genetics. Okay. So I checked in just to see what they offer. And apparently companies that want to breed Shaver chickens can purchase parent stock from Hendrix Genetics. Okay. Now, they don't tell you what these breeds are. So this is probably trade secret. Is it like a grab bag of what you're going to get? I don't know. I mean, they really give no information about what the parent will be other than it's the parent stock will produce the shaver chickens. Okay. And again, I think it's largely industrial. We know that the brown shaver is popular in New Zealand, so clearly someone in New Zealand is buying parent stock to breed them. They are pretty chickens. Uh-huh. They come in brown, they come in red, and it looks like they have white tails, which right. is, they're really cute. Right. We don't have a lot of information about their general health, that sort of thing. Right. Um, There's just not much out there. There really isn't that much out there. And our guest that's coming up later actually owns the Round Chambers. Right. So we'll talk about them again in just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So now it is time to go across the pond to visit Fiona for our broody report. Coffee with Fiona. Yeah. Yeah. Jazz hands, everyone. Jazz hands. (laughs) Major jazz hands. How are you doing, Fiona? Really well. It's been a really, really, really busy week. Yeah. So much has happened. I know. So the broody report's going to be packed full of a lot of stuff this week. Four broody hens. Four broody you, hens hatching. Wow. Craziness. You Craziness. have a lot of babies running around now, don't you? 32? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of babies. Just a couple. Yeah, so but we, we all also... one hen down, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. It's so yeah. sad. We have another guest to bring on today, and she is a local peep. And she is from the same county that I'm in, actually. And you might know her on Instagram as Marilyn Farm Girl. Hey, Kate, how are you doing? Good. How are you? We're great. We're great. It's so great to have you on. You yeah. are a first time broody mommy. Yup. <laughs> so exciting. So we wanted to bring you on the broody report with Fiona. We thought it would be awesome for you to share your experience with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I'm definitely excited to share. <laughs> so, how many eggs did you start with? Six. And how many hatched? Six. Awesome. awesome. That's fantastic. I didn't think it was going to happen, but they all hatched. That's a good result. Now, yeah, did you I, have her separate from everybody else, the Bruni mom? Not at first. So, obviously, like first time, I, I didn't know what really to do when she started going Bruni. So, it was probably like the last week we kind of like rigged up the coop and put some chicken wire up and divided it so that she was separate. It was only like really the last week that she was like separate from everyone else. And of course, now they're, they're still separated from 
the other chickens, but that's what I did. I didn't really know what I was doing. No, no, that's fine. That's part of being the first time broody mom and learning. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the only problem that it would cause is other hens laying their eggs in the nest. And if actually the hens are very good with each other, there won't be any disputes. The broody hen just gets off. We do normally separate all the broody hens, but I've got a new broody at the moment. And we've got every single coop we've got. All eight are in use. So she's not getting her own coop. So she is sharing a coop at the moment. And when the other hen wants to come and lay, she just gets up, goes for her daily bath and a bit of a food, a bit of a run around. Then when Laurel's finished laying, Willow comes back in. And then there's some time that they're in there together, just kind of hanging out, each sitting on their nest? Only when they're sleeping. So Willow will come out when Laurel's laying. And then Willow just comes back in, goes back on her nest and... Then we've got a job to fish out the egg, which is Laurel's. That's what I was going to ask you. How do you get Laurel's <laughs> egg out of there after she lays it? Willow's very good. We don't have aggressive broodies because over the years, we've basically only kept the hens, which are calm. So we don't have aggressive broodies. So we can just gently lift her up. And because we've marked all of the eggs uh, oh, with, okay. you know, with an X or a circle, hers have actually got black Sharpie pen all the way around. So we can see in all directions which oh. eggs are she's supposed to be brooding on so we can easily pick out the one which is not marked and it's, know that that's what I was going to say Kate that's another good tip for next time I actually did that they didn't really know it was funny because like my husband googling we're like googling like and he's like get the sharpie out so I did <laughs> I, I x on all of them <laughs> so that's what I did it's so simple but it works doesn't it yeah, because otherwise I don't think I would have known like her eggs versus because we did end up with one of my other hens eggs. Like if you see my pictures on Instagram, I have one little yellow baby. Yeah. That's so cool. So marking the eggs going back and forth. And the funny thing that we were talking about is right before you had the hatch happen, you looked up and found some of Fiona's videos on kind of helping to direct you. So it was like, I don't know, a few days, I think before, like, cause you know, I counted like the 21 days and like marked on my calendar. She was acting a little different. And I was like, are the eggs about to hatch? And that's why she's acting this way. So I, I get on YouTube and I'm like looking up like chicks about to hatch, like you know, broody hen. And what if Fiona's videos came up and I'm like watching it and yeah. I, I And then it was like the next day, one of your episodes came out and I was like, that's Fiona from YouTube. <laughs> That's so flattering. Thank you. So Fiona, before they hatch, do the broody hens act differently? That's a great question. They do because the chicks and the eggs are actually talking to the broody hens. So they actually start to cheep and communicate. So the hen starts making kind of like a low booming noise and they're far more alert We have like a little hidden camera we put in, not a remote camera, but a little hidden camera. And you can see that she becomes a lot more alert. She's moving around a little bit more. And the chicks, if you listen really carefully, you can actually hear them cheeping underneath her. It's so fantastic to watch. I'm sure it's adorable. Oh, my goodness. So, Kate, is that what you were seeing? She was up and like moving around and I was like, what's going on? Like she acts like she wanted like to get out of the coop. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, so definitely noticed a change in behavior, probably like two or three days before the chicks hatched. And then how long did it take for all your chicks to hatch? So I think I miscalculated somewhere or I didn't know like how long she had been broody because we actually canceled our Memorial Day plans because we were going to go away for the weekend. But me and my husband were like, I think these chicks are coming like sooner than like <laughs> canceled our plans. We stayed home and they ended up coming. I guess it was that Saturday, but I didn't know till Sunday because we had bad weather Memorial yes, Day. It rained that whole weekend. I I wasn't out there like I should have been. And I think I missed it, which stinks. So it was Sunday that I finally saw them and they were all under there. The cutest thing in the whole world. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That is the nicest when you're actually trying to work out how many chicks have actually hatched. And it's, oh, there's one. Oh, there's two. Oh, oh, there's three. You just get so (laughs) excited. And I still go through that every time. So Fiona, tell us how your hatches have gone. Well, four broody hens. 
you know about Cinnamon and Frankie, they started to sit on the same day. Right. But two days later, we had another Buff Orpington called Rowan, and she sat. We also had Halloumi, the old English pheasant fowl, sitting. So it's musical eggs. So bear with me because this okay. is going to get complicated. <laughs> so we started with 21 of our own eggs for Frankie and Cinnamon. And it kind of didn't matter how many each of them got. So our plan was that each of them would have a certain amount of eggs and then we'd work out how many were fertile and even them up before hatch day. Right. So we started with Frankie was sitting on five because, you know, she's brain damaged and we had concerns about whether she was going to poop in the nest or not. And seven eggs in an incubator. And Cinnamon sat on nine because she's a bigger chicken. Actually, she can sit on 14, but we thought... That's you know, a lot of eggs. Yeah, she's a big chicken. So that's how we started. Then Rowan, when she started to uh, brood... We actually bought in some eggs because we wanted to have a hatch for the new cockerel for the following breeding year. Mm -hmm. And every year we bring in some new genetic material with a new cockerel so that right. we're not into breeding. So we bought in 18 eggs, and that's because postal eggs don't do quite as well. You know, it's a little bit of shaking. You never get the same kind of hatch rate. So we bought in 18, thinking that 12 would be fertile and we'd probably have nine hatch. That was fine. Then we had Halloumi, who had seven cream leg bar eggs to sit okay. on. So this is what happened. Rowan, who had the 18 bought in eggs, and she was only sh sat on a small amount of them, 16 of the 18 were fertile when we candled them. Wow. I know, for postal <laughs> eggs, we were shocked. So then we had to think, what do we do here? Because actually, from the three coops those chickens were sitting in, Rowan was in the smallest coop. And that coop was designed probably to take maximum nine or 10 chicks with oh, the Buffalo Hinton. I know. So we had to move things around. But the good news is because there was only two days of hatch day between Cinnamon and Frankie and Rowan separately, we could swap things around. So what we decided to do was the eggs that Frankie was sitting on would go to Rowan and Rowan's eggs would go to Frankie. So okay. we put quite a few in the incubator, but actually Frankie can hatch quite a lot. So what we ended up with was Rowan got nine eggs in the end in total, and she hatched seven. Nice. Cinnamon yeah. got 12 eggs and she hatched 11. Nice. Wow. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But one, unfortunately, was accidentally crushed which can what, happen with large yes. mommy hens and very small chicks. We've talked about that before, about large mamas can accidentally do that. It is so sad, but a reality. Yeah, I mean, there's so many advantages of having broody hens with chicks rather than an incubator and brooder because they are socialized with the rest of the group so much earlier on. They do everything for you. They make sure they're warm, they're fed, they're watered. You know, I know we've talked about this before, but there's so many advantages but yes. you do get this uh, as a disadvantage. And it's not nice when you find no. it in the coop. But unfortunately, it does happen. Now, two of Cinnamon's chicks needed a little bit of help to get out right. of the egg. So one was in chick ICU, had to be hatched in an incubator and then helped in the brooder and then went back to Cinnamon. The other one actually had come out of the egg, but wasn't quite as strong. So we popped her in the brooder and helped her along. So actually, she's now got 10 very, very healthy Buff Orpington Good. chicks. Nice. Good. Frankie, who actually got the biggest coop, did incredibly well. She ended up with, of the 16 eggs which were fertile, 14 of them in the end got to the end of the incubation period and they were still fertile. So two started to develop and then stopped in the end. Okay. So 14 went to Frankie. She actually hatched 13. Wow. Go Frankie. I know. Nice. She's, <laughs> oh, you should see her. She's such a good broody hen. But in is the she meantime, loving her babies? She is. She's doing a fantastic job with them. Oh. But on the... Sad side, Halumi, our old English pheasant fowl, you know that she had problems with wanting to eat. 
We talked about this in yep. the previous report that she went through the longest spell that you had seen with a broody mom stopped eating and not coming out and you had to entice her with hot mash. Yeah. And she ate the hot mash for about three or four days and then stopped eating again and oh. then start eating again. And unfortunately on hatch day, we always leave the hens alone on hatch day so that they have some peace and quiet and you don't disturb them. But I did decide to go check on her quite late in the day when we were expecting the eggs to have been hatched. And unfortunately, Halloumi didn't make it. I think her little body gave up, unfortunately. It's so sad. We are so sorry. And that is such a harsh reality. And we wish that you didn't have to go through that. I was absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated, because we recently lost my pet chicken the week before, Mm -hmm. who was eight years old, and actually the great, 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 great grandmother to most of the hens that we've got. So getting a loss with Halloumi at the same time was just so devastating. What was worse, she had seven eggs per hatch. Three had gone cold and actually there was no noise, no movement. They died in the egg. But we managed to save four. And we hatched four in an incubator. We had to make a decision where they were going to go. They couldn't go to Frankie because she'd already hatched 13. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go to Rowan because she'd successfully hatched seven. And obviously the coop she was in was quite small, as we said, why we swap things around. So she couldn't get them. So the four youngsters, which were two days younger than the Buff Orpingtons, those four cream leg bars would need to go to Cinnamon. So we hatched them in an incubator. They had a day under an artificial brooder, were popped under Cinnamon's wing on the next night. She's accepted them straight away. Normally, we'd let the hens out to mingle with the flock within 24 hours, but we'd right. let them run on for four days in the end before we yeah. released them. Okay. We're just so sad about Halloumi. Was she a little over a year old? Was yes, she-, she was hatched this time last year. Yeah. yeah so she was last year's spring hatch. So you were very sad about what happened, and but then you had to spring into action for the babies. On hatch day, we're always ready. So we have an old tin bath. We fill it with wood shavings. We have the brooder already heated up and ready to roll long before mm-hmm. any chicks. So if we don't need it, fantastic. We just turn the brooder off and right. put everything away. It's not a problem. Right. But we do have it ready to go. And we also have our spare incubator ready to go as right. well. Just in case for these exact reasons that something takes a wrong turn and you have to react so quickly. And the four babies are doing well with cinnamon right now. They're doing great. We were worried for the first 24 hours because obviously they were two days younger than the others. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you've got something as small as the chicks... You know, after two days, they're starting to put out little wing feathers. And, you know, you would have seen that with your chicks. Although in the brooder, they looked like they had lots of mobility. They were zooming around a little bit. They weren't as fast as the buff walking turns. Yeah. Okay. So if we'd let Cinnamon out of the run immediately, she would have just zoomed off. The buff walking turns followed and the little cream leg Would have been left behind. Absolutely. But it's all worked out. It's all fine. We were prepared for it and we had a good result in the end. Yeah. But yeah, losing Halloumi was a bit difficult. It's so hard to lose one that you have close to your heart. There was no symptoms. There there was nothing about her to be concerned about. You know, you do all the standard checks. So you look for discharge from the eyes, from the nose, the mouth, the vent. You look for any little mites or lice or anything else which could be on her body. Well, we'll just say rest in peace, sweet Halloumi. And we're sending you love and hugs over there. Thank you. She was all set to become Gannett's replacement as my pet. Yeah, I know. That's rough. It's been a rough two weeks. Well, I think it's going to be Gouda now. They are called the Cheesy Chicks because there's Brie as well. Gouda and Brie. That's what happens when you let your Twitter followers (laughs) make you chickens. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So do you have any more eggs that are going to be hatched? Oh, yes. Okay. So we now have Hazel, who has, I think there's 15 I think. Wow. All Orpington? All Orpington. Okay. We then have Willow, who has 18. 18. Yes. And those, the 18, again, those are purchased eggs. So those are postal eggs. So that's why there's 18. So we're not Mm -hmm. expecting 18 to hatch. Right. 
And then we have Moye, who is a little cream leg bar herself. We have 12 bought in well summers. Oh, like Gertie. Yes. My Gertie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Gertie, so my I, baby. I was trying to get hold of some Barnvelder eggs, mm-hmm. but the yeah. seller that uh, sold them to me let me down. Oh. They took the sale and then didn't inform us that they'd sold all their available right. eggs and we would Good have heavens. to wait for a few days. Yeah. So we found a wonderful seller who had uh, very good recommendations uh, for Well Summers. Someone put us on to them and contacted them, said, they could they send some out special delivery, which is a 24-hour service? Right. They arrived the next day. And then the Barnvelder eggs turned up. Oh, oh man. For heaven's sake. I know. So I want to go to Kate. She's been quiet, but I want to see if you have any questions from your experience or anything you want to put out there, you know, taking care of a broody mom and hatching eggs. Yeah. Just going back to how unfortunate it is to lose a chicken. It's just so crazy. Like you, sometimes you just don't really know, like, even though you like check on them every day, you look for the signs. It's so hard. Sometimes they just don't always tell you like what's wrong. And I had a chicken that passed away last summer, but this is my first experience with like a broody hen. So now I'm just wondering like, what's next for her? Like, is she going to be broody again like this summer? No, now she's brooded. The likelihood is because she's got chicks that those broody hormones won't flood her system until the next opportunity. And it's possible she might brood in autumn. But that's only a few of the chickens which brood in spring will brood again in autumn. So it's more likely she won't brood again until spring, unless there's very strange weather conditions. For years, we just had um, broody hens that only brooded in spring. And then last summer, we had amazing hot temperatures in April. I mean, unseasonably warm, very, very hot for, for the UK. And we had a hen... Actually, it was Frankie. So Frankie was allowed to brood. She raised her chicks. And then in about August, so she came back on to lay after making her chicks independent, then came back on to lay for two weeks, fell broody again. We didn't want her to brood because she was still a little bit underweight. So we did our method of breaking them, which basically we give her some false eggs just for seven days, take them away. And then she realizes, oh, I've not got anything to sit on and get gets up and goes away. Now that that's not fail safe. That doesn't always work, but it does work with Frankie. So we did that. She then went away, came back on to lay, laid for two weeks, did the whole thing again. So she fell broody again in September, and then she did it again in October. I do think if we'd given her some eggs when she brooded the second time in August that she wouldn't have brooded again just because she would have had chicks to look after and it's she's not going to brood when she's got chicks. So Kate, do you feel that your broody hen has lost weight along with the process or do you think she kind of kept herself going? I actually have not noticed like any weight loss with her. She looks really good. Before I sectioned off the coop and separated her, she would still like go out into the run like, you know, very briefly, but mm-hmm definitely was eating like normal poop. Like she did really well. Like, I'm just so amazed by her. <laughs> what breed she is she? She sounds fantastic. <laughs> she is an Osterlorp. She's an Osterlorp. Okay. Nice. Just like the Buff Orpington there, they want to be mommies. And she is such a good mom. She really is. It just, it's amazing to watch, honestly. Right. Well, Aww. the Osterlorps are, are descended from the Orpingtons. They yes. were bred from the Orpingtons. So yep. that's why they're awesome. They say they're the Australian Orpington. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) That's all they say. Australian Orpington, yes. Yep. I thought they'd actually had the broodiness bred out of them, but I'm hearing lots of people telling me that their Australops are broody. And it's so funny. I thought that one of my chickens was going to go broody, like never crossed my mind. Like, I I don't know why. I just didn't think I was ever going to experience this, but she did it. (laughs) So when are you planning to let the chicks mingle and out with the other chickens? So maybe that's another question I have for you. So I'm thinking, guessing, so I'm going to keep them separate for six weeks is what I'm figuring out is normal for the mom to stay with the chicks. And then I don't know what's next. Do I just let her go out back with the other chickens? And do I keep the chicks separate? 
Well, Should I tell that. you what we do? I think that see if that helps. So the, the broody hens and the chicks are kept separate in a run just for 24 hours. Then we oh. take the run away and they go out. And actually, the sooner you can let them out with the other hens, the sooner they understand the pecking order. The longer you leave it, the harder it is in terms of getting used to the pecking order because when they're little the other hens might look at them and it's more curiosity of what on earth is that (laughs) and wander up and have a look but as soon as they recognize their chickens they can get a little bit aggressive so if they're at a stage where they see them as chicks and not as chickens it's easier for them to accept plus the booty hen will defend them that's what i was going to say that's the time that the mom is going to step up and say whoa back off my babies and protects them when they're smaller we found with cinnamon even though she was only in the run for four days when we let her out there was a couple of the younger chickens tried it on with cinnamon from a pecking order point of view not going at the chicks but going at her okay because she was always second in command of the flock i'm telling you these these chicken girls are hard core (laughs) they all want to be last long yeah. There, there was a there was a couple of dust ups and it was over very very quickly shall we say and cinnamon came out top. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she she cinnamon down, is the girl. She put down the answer. She is. She's like, I don't think so. But it is a case of we have found that the longer you you leave it, that it can become more problematic. But just keep an eye on them. You know, if you've got a date, if you can do it at a weekend when you're around, let them out then, just see how it goes. And actually, what might be an idea is try it later in the day, just before roosting, because then if there is any issues, it's easier to get it back in, out of the way. Good point. So, ladies, I want to say thank you both for joining us. And Kate, just let everybody know, she is making some candles, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're out there. So... Check her out on Instagram, Marilyn Farm Girl. And you know, Fiona has the fantastic YouTube series, English Country Life. And there'll be a video to accompany this so everyone can see musical chickens. You can see the hatches, the chicks themselves. You can also see the little cream leg bars getting introduced to cinnamon and being popped oh. under her wing. Oh, that's adorable. Our new favorite is, breed. Right? Holly Ann and I love, we do love the leg bars. They're fantastic. I <laughs> love them. They're like the sweetest little things ever in the world. But you know, they're supposed to be auto sexing. Right. Yeah. We're still not sure what we've got. We know we've got really? one boy. We know we've got one girl. Okay. But there's two which have got clearly defined markings like the female, but it's not dark enough. Oh, oh, a little man. bit lighter. So we just don't know. Okay. So this is going to be a little bit of a, you know, let's wait. Guessing and see game. What we've got. Well, really, if, if it turned out you, that you had three pullets and one cockerel, that's a pretty nice hatch right there. Yeah. I think it's probably more likely to be the other uh, way around. One pullet and three cockerels. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> As always, I will have links in our show notes to both English Country Life and to this week's Broody Report video. Fiona, thank you so much. And Kate, thank you for joining us. Thank Thank you you so much, ladies. We'll see you ladies later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. We'll look forward to talking to Fiona again next week. Okay, so now we're ready to move on to our main topic. And basically, our main topic is geared a little towards our guest that's going to be coming up. Right. Not a little, a lot. And it's actually a subject that's pretty popular in the chicken world right now. It is. So we figured we would kind of unearth it a little bit. Just a little bit of background on holistic chicken health care. That's right. And we're just going to bring up a little bit about what holistic care in general is. The thing to remember about holistic care is think of whole. Right. The entire animal or person. Or person. And that's kind of where this form of taking care of something or someone is coming from. It takes care of the whole person, whole animal. So there's lots of different ways to treat an animal holistically. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. There could be diet modification, change in living quarters, behavioral, behavioral modification, right? There are also complementary therapies Yes, that go alongside of traditional veterinary care. This is one that we really like. If you work along with a veterinarian, you can use holistic medicine with mainstream medicine and it can work really well together. Absolutely. 
So say you have a problem uh, and acupuncture might work along with a nerve medication. Right. So those types of things can work really, really well together. Holistic medication also is a lot of times based on herbal remedies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And things like that. Right. We are big fans of preventative care. Yes. And a lot of the preventative care does fall under the holistic label. It does because a lot of times herbs and different things mm -hmm. are going to prevent things from happening. Exactly. Now, we do believe strongly that if your chicken has a serious health issue, they need to be seen by an avian veterinarian. By a doctor. What's that old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Yeah. I mean, preventative medicine is huge. When I worked in an animal hospital, I used to have to talk to the client, the owner of the animals. That's right. For at least, I would talk to them 20 to 30 minutes before the doctor even entered the room. Right. And go over preventative medicine. Right. The other things like you were talking about, holistic health care and the way that people live, how much you sleep, what kind your of environment. environment you're in. Being right on top of your chicken's coop and area, knowing what's going on in there goes a long way. For instance, mite prevention. Right. So if a chicken has a, a bad outbreak of mites, the only thing that's going to cure it is pyrethrin-based treatment. Mm -hmm. A bad infestation will not be killed by diatomaceous earth. It will not be killed by wood ash. But those things are excellent in a dust bath to help prevent the mites. Oh, yes. And if you're in your chicken's run and coop and regularly looking around, wiping down the perches with mint oil, other things that repel the bugs, it goes a long way towards prevention. Even growing the herbs that prevent Absolutely. Like, flies and other things from coming in. That's all part of holistic care. Right. It's part of using nature to take care of the whole body. So you would think, okay, you have a back problem, so you're going to try pain medicine. If that doesn't work, you're going to try acupuncture, and then you're going to try yoga. This is all the same way. Mm -hmm. So if you have a chicken, we had the question a few weeks ago from Teddy, right? which I thought was so interesting. She knew an acupuncturist and yeah. said, I've done acupuncture on chicken. Why not? Why not? Indeed. They yeah. have nerves. Acupuncture absolutely has beneficial properties to it. Things like diet modification. Mm -hmm. In animals, if a pH is too high, it can cause urinary right. problems. All these different things you can change naturally. So we're kind of getting around the point that we're going to be talking with someone who is working in holistic health care. He's a holistic animal practitioner. Guess where? He's in New Zealand. Yay! So we're going to be talking to him about what a day in his life actually kind of looks like and how he treats animals, and he's actually treated chickens. Yes, so he has a couple of examples for us. And he treats them holistically. So, Holly, you had a really cool story that you were telling me about earlier. Yeah, I was looking for some examples, some documented stories of birds that had been treated with complementary therapies. On Poultry DVM, I found the story of Matilda. Okay. Matilda's a barred rock hen who had been hit by a car. Oh, my God. It's yeah, awful. it's awful. And she had healed, but she was unable to use her legs and she had stopped laying eggs. Okay. So the person who took charge of her, who adopted her, worked at a small animal hospital herself. Okay. And at that hospital, they used laser therapy and acupuncture on dogs and cats. Okay. So they figured, why not try this on Matilda? Exactly. So the doctor prescribed a course of anti-inflammatories. Right. And then they began the laser therapy and the acupuncture. And I think within a couple of weeks, she was running. It's a, actually a perfect example of holistic to conventional medicine. Right. And using them both. Now, do we know, was it the anti-inflammatory or was it the acupuncture or was it them combined? Was it them combined? Exactly. So it's always a good thing to use both in conjunction. Right. It cannot hurt. I think other research shows that complementary therapies tend to be more favorable. They do. And if you look right now on the market of poultry snacks, poultry treats, poultry food, these things are worked in all the herbal remedies right down the marigolds. Right. Oregano, that have, garlic, all of the above. That are going to help preventatively mm -hmm. and holistically keep that chicken healthy so that those problems are knocked down. Right. So that's what we say, like holistically preventative measure is huge. Mm -hmm. Pumpkin seeds help for deworming. Pumpkin seeds can, help. they're never going to take the worms away. I'm not even sure what the mechanism is, but they can help prevent a worm load from manifesting. However, if your chicken has a worm load, nothing is going to get rid of it except a dewormer. A dewormer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's where these things are great to work in. And I speak 
from 20 years experience having tried most of these things. I've tried everything also. And the way that I see it is preventative. Absolutely. And what I preached for 15 years in the small animal medicine myself is preventative care. Exactly. And holistic is right there, number one in preventative care. Absolutely. It is. Say you get a problem. We've both had chickens with crop problems. That we could not fix. Nothing's going to fix except for a doctor in the hospital. Have a good balance with it. Yeah. And this is, again, we can't say this enough, having somebody to bounce those ideas off of. Chicken buddy. Chicken buddy. We can't say it enough. We are chicken buddies for life, Holly Ann and I. So we bounce stuff off of each other all the time. Right. And having that type of person helps immensely. It's invaluable. It is. If you have somebody and you say, Holly Ann, I want to do acupuncture for Gertie. I can see you saying, why not try it? Absolutely. It's not going to hurt anything. It can only help. Exactly. We have a special guest here with us today, and his name is Andy Garcia, and he's joining us all the way from New Zealand. He is a holistic animal practitioner, and we spoke to him on his podcast about a month or two ago, and it was such a fun interview that we said, we need you to come on our show. So welcome, Andy. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. You know, it's a really a pleasure to be here today, sipping coffee with coffee with the chicken ladies. It's awesome. <laughs> we have some cold brew going on because it's uh, yeah. hot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but sometimes need, you got to do what you got to do, right? We need that caffeine, though. That's for sure. <laughs> so your story is so interesting. We thought we would start by asking you, because you're from the States, you're from the West Coast. What took you to New Zealand? Born and raised in California, pretty much lived my entire life in California until I moved to New Zealand. And that was back in 2015 when we were just looking to get out of California. At the time, my kids were two and four, and we were kind of looking at each other, my wife and I, going, Is this the place where we want to raise our kids? And both of us were like, Ah, not really. I think there's better out there for them. Right. We want to be a little bit more rural, a little bit more laid back, easy going. You know, some parts of California, you can find that. We just wanted to venture off. And my wife's a bit of a gypsy soul, too. So, you know, she was even more eager to find somewhere new, ultimately. Right. So what happened was a friend of ours is a flight attendant for Hawaiian Airlines. And she was going to start the route flying from Honolulu to Auckland. Okay. And we got to talking with her and she goes, you know what? You should check out New Zealand. And we're like, New Zealand, where's that again? (laughs) And, uh, you know, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. It's down there by Australia, Southern hemisphere, little island nation in a way, South Pacific. And she hadn't done the route yet, but she says, everybody I've talked to all my flight attendant friends say it's a really cool place, really laid back. She was doing a little research on it herself as well, getting ready to fly down there and start doing this regular trip. And she said, I think it'll fit your guys' lifestyle pretty well. And so we said, well, you know what, let's start doing research on it as well. So, you know, we checked into things, you know, what's the school system like? Because it was all about the kids, right? What's the school system like? Yeah, it always is. It always is. You know, it always comes down to them. So what's the school system like? And what type of government do they operate? What's the culture like? And so we said, the best thing to do is just go down there and find out ourselves, right? So we booked this three-week vacation, we call it a holiday here in New Zealand, three-week holiday to check things out and see if this was a potential place that we would want to move to. After about two weeks in, it was, all right, let's figure this out. This is the place where we want to be. Let's figure out how we can move here. And it really was all about the culture, the real family-friendly atmosphere. Everywhere you go, it seemed like they catered to the kids. No matter how, you know what the fanciest restaurant you were at, you know there'd always be a box of toys for the kids to go play in or playgrounds and right. you know you know especially in Auckland where it feel, you feel like everybody's living on the beach, which is really cool <laughs> as well. Or you just got to drive up and over the hill, and then there's the beach. So you know everything was just really attractive for us, and we liked the lifestyle, the laid back Kiwi culture, just kind of chill. And they really are just a really chill type of people. So what we did is that three-week stay turned into seven weeks. So we extended it another four weeks. Wow. And during that time, we rented a house. We found a preschool 
for my daughter to start. She's the oldest. So she was four at the time. So it was able to plug her into preschool. And it was so cool where we just showed up and looked around the preschool, talked to the principal and we go, um, how quickly can she start? And it was, I think it was like Thursday. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, she could start Monday if she wants. It was just nice. like that, you know, just yeah, that laid back. Awesome. You know, we figured, okay, well, we need to figure out how we're going to stay uh, visa wise. How, you know, what are we going to do there? So the funny thing was, this is where the animal health practitioner comes in. During those first two weeks, we were kind of looking to network, meet people, meet like-minded people. We were always into natural health for the past few years. We had been getting into more of a natural health approach. Right. So my wife found this conference. We thought it was like maybe a little conference or a talk, a little seminar on introduction to homeopathy. And it was at this college called the College of Natural Health and Homeopathy. And we said, oh, that's kind of cool. Why don't we go check it out? We'll meet a few people and learn a little bit more about homeopathy. What we didn't realize is that this was like an introduction to the college, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we sat around this boardroom and it was very small. There was only like maybe three or four of us there. And uh, we sat around this boardroom and talked to the dean and we talked to like the head teacher, instructor and everything. And they were wow, discussing. Wow, small. <laughs> yes, it was very small, very small school, very small private college type deal, you know, kind of a trade school in a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we thought it was interesting, but didn't think much of it. We're like, oh, we walked away going, that wasn't exactly what we were thinking. But my wife kind of looked at me and she goes, they were talking about, you know, the animal health side was, would that be something that you'd be interested in? And I said, you know what? I kind of am interested in that, you know, and it was one of those things where you've been kind of working with animals. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on, how the evolution of becoming a practitioner, you know, all throughout my life came about. But this specific program was starting to call me. So what happened was we kind of looked at each other and, and I said, you know what? I'd like to take on this program. So we talked to the immigration specialists and, and they go, you know what? Funny enough, this program is going to allow you to bring your family and move to New Zealand on a, a student visa. Okay, and, perfect. And so I jumped all over it and we basically, yeah. you know, reached out to the parents saying, sorry, but we're moving to New Zealand. And they were just like, what's going on here? You're moving, <laughs> you're moving to New Zealand. I thought you were just going on a, on a holiday. And then now you're telling us you're moving permanently. So they were a little bit upset, but you know, they got over it eventually. And uh, yeah, so we just moved to New Zealand, settled right in nicely. I started the program, which was in 2015. I was going to say, how long was the program? How long yeah, did four, that take? Four years. Wow. So it was awesome. a four-year program. And uh, yeah, we finished up in 2018. So I think the first year I had to do kind of like a catch-up deal and it sped up the process a little bit and uh, went to summer school type deal as well. So yeah, 2018, finished the program and just started my practice. So. That's kind of That's how we amazing. landed here. And are you loving it? Are you loving being an animal, a holistic animal practitioner? Oh, it's it's absolutely incredible. So we talked about, you know, I've always had animals, cats and dogs for the most part. I've been an avid dog lover. And ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to work with animals. You know, I was, you know, the five-year-old that wanted to be, you know, like a dolphin trainer or something like yeah. that when I grew up. And, I, you know, and, and I think in high school, I had some ideas of maybe bringing a cop dog trainer or breeding dogs. And there, you know, I was on that vibe for a little bit of breeding dogs. And then I kind of, you know, stepped away from that. So oh, there's, there's more animals that need to be rescued. So, but I started to work with my own dogs, taking a more natural approach from that. It just started to evolve where I started to gain a reputation. People started asking me, what are you doing naturally? And so, you know, I'd, I'd share what I was doing, but it wasn't on a professional level. And so when this program became available for me to attend, it was like, you know what, this is time for me to up-level myself and really find that career working with animals that I've really always desired, just didn't know exactly what that looked like until that day when we stepped into this, you know, college open day and I realized this is it. Everything happens for a reason, you know, <laughs> yes. you have a love for animals. And that's one thing I always say that passion for animals isn't something that comes and goes, you know, you're born with it and it never goes away. It really doesn't. So how do your chickens fit into all of this? <laughs> yes. I'm somewhat of a new chicken keeper in 2018, maybe 19. Anyway, somewhere around that time, a couple of years ago, 
we decided to get a, a three chickens. And this kind of came about where we wanted some fresh eggs and we, were, we had this little lifestyle block that we we're renting out, a little, little farm that we're renting out here in New Zealand and still are. This is where I'm currently at now. We have about two acres. Nice. And we thought, well, that'd be cool for them to free range. There's plenty of trees and they dump tons of leaves, which just makes an excellent place for chickens to scratch and everything oh, else. Yeah. Plenty of bug <laughs> life around here. So we said, well, let's get a handful of chickens. Uh, we'll get some fresh eggs. And so then we started off with three pullets and they were about, they were already laying. They were just starting okay. to lay eggs. Yeah. Six to eight months probably then. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, brown shavers. So we started off with three brown shavers. And from there, the flock kind of just grew. We, we got a couple of more and then we decided, okay, well, let's get a couple more. And we, oh, we don't want to get too many. Obviously there's, you know, you just got to care for them. And, and we wanted to make sure that the flock just didn't get too big. So yeah, little by little, we've kind of grew our flock. So now we're currently sitting at eight chickens <laughs> and chickens. just absolutely loving every bit of it. I mean, they are just phenomenal animals, which I, it just caught me off guard. Like we yeah. Yeah. In, initially were like, let's have some fresh eggs. That sounds great. But we didn't realize what else they could do. For one, they're entertaining. You know, yes. you can just simply, you know, watch them for hours and they just keep you entertained. The kids love them. So it was oh, a yeah. good, good way for the kids to interact with another type of animal. Uh, you know, then they I noticed that they were eating all the weeds and they would take care of the food scraps. So we had zero waste going on, nearly yeah. zero waste. Yep. What else? I mean, they were on, we, we, you know, bug control. We would actually, we had a couple of them that we would train to go out into the, to the veggie garden with us. And we'd pick up, we'd tilt up the pots and they would eat the slugs down mm -hmm. below. They would be out there trying to catch the, uh, the white butterflies that cause havoc in the garden and everything else. They were just working animals. And I was yeah. just caught off guard. And, and of course, all the little compost that you can, you know, use from them as well. Totally you know, that would go back into the garden. So it's kind of this nice little circle of life that you got going on when you own chickens. And it's really cool to be a part of that. So they're just our friends now. And, and we just absolutely love the girls. So you mentioned the lifestyle block, which is yeah. not something we have here in the U.S. So is that a little bit like a, like homestead sort of? Yeah, a little bit. They call them lifestyle blocks. They're just basically homes that are on, you know, one to three acres. It's okay. considered okay. a lifestyle block. And it's just kind of that laid back farm lifestyle. Um, Best lifestyle so, ever. <laughs> yes. It's cool. It's so cool. You know, and it's, it's very fortunate to have this property, which, you know, has funny enough, redwood trees and, you know, nice. native bush, New Zealand trees all over the place. And there's oh, wow. probably like hundred, hundred plus mature trees all over. And it's just a great piece of property. It's in, in a little town called Puhoi, which is a you know a historical town in New Zealand, kind of a tourist destination. So, yeah, it's just amazing. It's yeah, a nice little fantastic. spot. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody some of the really good things about chicken keeping in New Zealand? Well, animal care in general is very friendly to New Zealand because we don't have the predators that other areas have, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have some, you know, some areas they've got the Harrier Hawk and the New Zealand Falcon that are going to, you know, potentially pick off your, your chicks. But for the most part, you know, you've got your dogs and your cats, and you've also got some uh, animals that would be going after the eggs, like weasels Thanks. and rats and even hedgehogs, birds. Oh, wow. We've got wow. the, the <laughs> um, yeah, the hedgehog will roll off the egg. And then we got some birds called the Weki and, and the Pukeko that will also go after the eggs as well and break them open and eat them. So the main thing is just making sure that your eggs are taken care of. But the adult birds, you know, they get on pretty well. In our area, I don't see, you know, you just don't have the hawks like that. So it's very nice. easy to care for the animals here. Of course, we've got plenty of green vegetation for them to constantly be picking at. New Zealand's a very green place. So they're always on a green diet constantly. You know, the grass is always green. And yeah. so it's, it's, it makes it easy to manage chickens here in New Zealand. And that goes with, you know, the most animals, you know, that's why sheep do so well, because they don't have the predators. Plus the grass is always green, you know, yeah. and, and cattle as well, you know, so New Zealand is known for their agriculture. So you mentioned your brown shavers and we have done our breed profile this episode. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the other breeds that you have? 
Okay, so we got the brown shavers, and you know, just not to spoil your your episode, but they're a commercial hybrid, uh, yeah. very friendly, great with the kids. They can be a little bit bossy. They're high production egg layers, so they do about mm-hmm. two hundred and eighty eggs a year. But I've also got an Osterlop. That's the Australian breed. Very docile, a little bit shy at first, but they warm up very quickly and can be just a real excellent bird especially with kids. They're extremely yeah. friendly. They're also known for their high egg production in mm-hmm. Australia. One study showed that, uh, you know, there was a group of birds that were producing like up to 300 eggs. Wow. But, um, anyways, wow. on average, they'll do about 250 beautiful black. What's the word? It may be iridescent kind of, kind of has the mm-hmm. green. Yeah. With the green sheen. Yep. The green yes. sheen. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And she's beautiful. And she was probably, well, we were told from the breeder that she would probably be show quality as well. Wow. Um, That's nice. Yeah. She's a really big bird too. She's really cool. So her name's (laughs) chocolate. So we call her Chalky. That's cute. They're they're beautiful birds. Absolutely. Then we've got her sister, you know, her um, flock sister, uh, which we got her at the same time and she's a a Chinese Ling Shen. So of course she's an Asian, you know, heritage bird. You got and, this one with that. <laughs> I love yes. that breed. And if oh. I remember correctly, this is Featherfoot Fran. Is that right? Yes, this I is remember. Featherfoot Franny. <laughs> Featherfoot Fran. Mm-hmm. She's cool. She's she's a big bird. I mean, she looks like a rooster. I think we talked about that on my podcast yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you could definitely, you know, confuse her for a rooster. And we thought she was at one time because it took her up to like eight months until she started laying eggs. Yep. But um, yeah, so she's got the feathers that come down her legs and, you know, into her feet. She's a little bit reserved, but friendly, you know, and once again, it's that black color with the iridescent and, you know, they're, they're, they're not as highly productive as far, as far as eggs go, they'll do about 180 roughly, but just a great bird to have around. And especially if you're, you know, looking to hatch eggs, I mean, she's, she's a (laughs) great sitter. I mean, she's (laughs) She goes broody and she's big too. So she can cover a dozen eggs. Yeah. And you wouldn't even know anything's under her. Perfect. She's like flat, like a pancake. You're like, oh, wait yeah. a minute. You look like double the chicken now. What My happened? Friend. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and she'll sit there forever too. And, and you know, I got to pull her off constantly. And, and anybody mm-hmm. goes broody and she just goes, nope, nope. I'm taking over again. So then she turns <laughs> automatically broody. So she's kind of good in that out. way. She kicks them out. Yeah. She's like, no, no, this is my job. You know, get out of here. So is she number one chicken in your flock then? Does she rule the roost? No, she doesn't. The brown shavers do actually. Wow. Okay. okay. I thought yeah. for sure you would have said that she rolls the roost. There's the Asiatic breeds, which are the Langshan, the yeah. Brahma, and the Cochin, they just tend to be super sweet. They just want to have babies. They want to have babies, but they, yeah, <laughs> yep. they're usually not the boss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The brown shavers. So we got the uh, Australop and the Langshan at the same time. And they're roughly about the same age. And then we had four. So we said, okay, well, let's get a couple more, right? So we're looking for two. And then we found an ad online that, you know, was promoting these three barred rock pullets. And they were, they were pretty young. I think they were about maybe three months old or so. I don't even think they were laying at the time. And we said, well, three, all right, you know, let's, let's, let's get them anyways. (laughs) Right. So we went to go pick them up. Actually, it was kind of a funny story. And the lady, she was kind of a backyard chicken keeper. And she goes, oh, you know, I I love these birds. I've hatched them and I raised them, but I bought a couple of other birds at the, at the show, uh, some kind of agricultural show, and they're just fighting all the time. Right. Ooh. And we talked about, you know, uh, how to migrate the flock. So yeah. she just wasn't familiar on how to do that. So she's trying to just kind of Throw toss them all everybody together. in the backyard oh. and it Ooh. wasn't working out. They were constantly fighting. And I said, oh, okay, well, I started to talk to her about it. And you can kind of see her face shift a bit. Cause like, oh, it takes time. You got to have like, you know, anywhere from two weeks to a month to migrate the flocks. Yeah. Um, and it, you got to keep them separated. And then she was kind of looking at me like, oh man, should I have done that? But then she's like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure they'll, I said, you know, we're going to take great care of them. So we're, we're happy to have them. So of course, the, you know, the, the, the barred rock is the, the Plymouth rock It's an American breed. I great for also. cold weather. Oh, you do? <laughs> yes. We call them the triplets. That's Leia, Linda, and lady actually they're a bit flighty they love to fly i mean now they're i don't know almost two years old and they still fly around the the property here from place to place they're a bit scrappy do they stick um, together know, the three of them are they always together 
You know, the flock kind of mixes up a bit. You know, the, the yeah, brown shavers okay. stick together quite good. You'll see a few that are that kind of crewed up for the day, like three yeah. different ones. And then the next day, it'll be a different crew of three. But they're, they're really cool birds. And we, we love the little triplets. And they do, <laughs> I think on average, they you know do about 200 eggs a year or so. The one bird, which we will talk about, and that's Uno. And she's unknown. She's just this really big lace feathered bird, very docile. I wonder if it's a wine dot. What does her comb look like? Just the basic uh, one. Yeah. Straight comb. Yeah. Like straight. Okay. Yeah. So I've been trying to figure it out, but she's very docile, very big, very big. She's almost as big as the Langshan actually. She's at the bottom of the hierarchy in our flock. And I think just because she's the new girl and the three triplets, they were not going to let her get the upper hand. So they, <laughs> That's they a hard always, rock for you. <laughs> yeah. They put her in place from early on and, you know, it took us a good month to actually migrate her into the flock, but there was some, you know, obviously medical care that we had to attend to with her for the first couple of weeks. So that brings us into what's the next thing we want to talk to you about. What do you do as a holistic animal practitioner? So holistic animal health practitioner a lot of people go, well, what do you do exactly? Are you a vet? I said, no, what I specialize is in natural solutions for animals that are in need, whether that's on a physical level or even on an emotional level too. Sometimes okay. I'll deal with a lot of emotional management and Anxiety behavioral and management. Animals. Yes, yeah. exactly. But I just take a holistic approach. So it's a private practice right now. I'm more mobile, but I do okay. work online via Zoom quite often, actually, because obviously I have a, a lot of connections within the United States. So all my some of my clients are in the States, um, nice. in Australia, even in New Zealand at times where, you know, I can't get to everywhere. So I'm able to consult through the video conferencing, which makes it great. You know, that's just, just, yeah. just the new day and age, right? The general operation of my business, and I'll get a client that will come in or, you know, reach out. And what we'll do is we will sit down and basically go through a consultation. You know, that consultation takes anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes, just depends on the situation. And what I want to know is anything and everything about the animal. So not only the presenting condition, but I also want to know about lifestyle. I want to know about the environment that the animal is in, the personality of the animal, prior history, previous medical conditions, anything and everything that might be related. I, I want to know where the animal sleeps at night. I want to know when the animal is best, um, like throughout the day, you know, and, and people will pick up on this stuff. Like, oh, you know what? He always seems to just do really good in the afternoons, but as soon as it's evening, then he goes back downhill again, right? So I, I want to know anything and everything. And then that way I can take the most holistic approach possible. So I'll, I'll take all these notes and I'll go analyze the situation and customize a wellness plan for that animal specifically. And so the wellness plan is going to may include, you know, natural protocols, diet change, supplementation, might even be a lifestyle change. And then from there, what I'll do is I'll present this uh, wellness plan to my clients. And then it's just a simple guide for them to follow. And then we'll do multiple checkups over the next 90 days. It's like a three month plan, basically, to make sure. So I want to work with people along the way to make sure they're getting enough support as we go through this process. And then sometimes I need to adjust the wellness plan as well. Okay, let's take that out. Let's let's add this in type mm -hmm. deal. So, um, yes, yeah, basically just customized wellness plans for my clients. You're treating the whole animal, the whole patient. Yes. Now, do you work along with a veterinarian also? So at times, at times I will. So if there's yeah. a medicine that could be, you know, they really need, they can do both things back and forth, with, work with you and the veterinarian. Yes, exactly. So something like diabetes that t tends to have to be managed by, you know, medication, but we'll mm -hmm. try and give the animal some supportive tools in terms of supplementation and maybe diet change or whatnot to try and boost the animal as much as possible. So yeah, you have to work hand in hand with the veterinarian at times. Yes. So we're wondering, have you treated any chickens? Yes, but I can share a couple of stories. Okay. And the first one is with the school chicken Uno. So I'd love to dive into that a bit and talk about mm -hmm. what happened with her. Um, like I talked about, there was three eggs that the kids hatched as a school project. 
and they had the chickens for about a year and still they still do but one of the chickens one day was starting to become ill and one of the parents ran up to me after i dropped my my kids off at school and she goes have you heard about the chicken the chicken's sick and i said no i didn't know let me let me go assess the situation so i went back home i grabbed some tools and i came back she had a prolapsed vent and basically yes. her insides were hanging out yeah. And we weren't too sure how long this was going on. We suspect it might have been like that for about five days. Wow. So oh I'm my thinking goodness. like, okay, this animal is in a bit of a dire situation. Yes. Yeah. Majorly. Um, so the first step was, okay, let's get this area cleaned up. Mm -hmm. So we put, we got this little rectangular tub and we filled it up with water. And I put a little bit of Dr. Bronner's Castile soap in there. And we and basically just let her, and it was warm water. We just let her soak in the tub basically for a bit. And we use a little bit of a uh, cloth and clean that back area up. And then from there, we pulled her out, dried her off. And we could feel that she had the egg kind of right there, oh, ready to kind of so come out. And we're, and oh, I'm going, goodness. I'm thinking, okay, we got to get, how long has this egg been there? Yeah. Um, we got to get this egg out. So we just gently massaged the area with the cloth and some apricot oil. And I took a little herbal spray to kind of relax the entire region, mm -hmm. you know, sprayed her down there and we held her and just kept, you know, reapplying and massaging. And the next thing you know, she laid the egg while oh, nice. the teacher was holding her in the arms. So it was great. Oh. You got the egg out. All right. That's, that's Good. step one. Yeah. Um, now let's just co constantly give her care. I told them to, you know, spray her down every couple of hours. We need to keep the area clean and then we'll see how we go um, overnight. Let's, let's, um, let's contain her. So let's keep her in her coop. And, you know, I don't want her around any other animals because they can get, uh, you know, especially the chickens, they can get a bit cannibalistic, you know, oh, they yeah. are, yes. you know, these little Definitely. dinosaurs and I don't want the other birds to start pecking at the region. And so from there, what we did is we assessed the situation the next day and it wasn't, I mean, it, everything popped back out. So we were trying to tuck it back in and, you know, once it was clean and it kept popping back out. And I, I told the, the school, I said, you got, this has got to be a constant thing. We like, you got to give her a bath every day. Um, you got to make sure that that region stays clean. And, and they said, oh, it's, it's OK, we'll we'll try to continue on. But, you know, the kids can't be attending to the bird all the time. Obviously, we're working with the yeah. kids as teachers. I say, you know what? Just let me bring the bird back to my farm and I'll give her the constant care needed. So that's what I did. So I built her basically a wellness plan. Once we got home, I said, okay, what do we need to do on a daily basis? So the first thing I put within, within her protocol is an Epsom salt bath mixed yeah. with a little bit of that Dr. Bronner's. So we gave her a little bit of a spa bath on a daily basis. The soaking added, really helps. Yeah. Just relaxed yeah. the region, kept it clean, especially with the Epsom salt. And I added in a drop uh, into the Epsom salts, a drop of lavender essential oil, because that's really calming. It can yeah, help yeah. the bird relax a bit more. It's going to ease any tension. And then I put clary sage as well, which supports the reproductive system. So that was her daily bath protocol. And I was telling nice. a mom at, at the school what I was doing. She's like, wait, this chicken's getting spa baths every day. Because <laughs> I, I need to go to your farm. <laughs> so I took her to the vet. And they pretty much said, uh, there's not much we can do. You know, she's, you know, it's prognosis is poor basically with the prolapsed event. If you're going to put the time in though, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. So what I did. And you from still there have her. So yeah. Yes, absolutely. So we made up a spray um, of apricot oil. Then I used Melissa essential oil, which is, which is a very expensive oil, but she's well worth it, which is going to support the immune system and keep the nice. area clean. Okay. Um, and, and then I added another drop of lavender as well. That's going to help support the skin. Every, everything mm -hmm. was starting to scab up back there. And yeah. then once again, Clary Sage. So once after she had her bath and I was able to spray her down consistently every couple of hours, we boosted okay. up the calcium in her diet. They're lacking calcium. This could be the cause of the issue. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I, I boosted up the calcium, put her on a real clean diet of, you know, of high protein and a lot of leafy greens. And, and mm -hmm. so she can get all her trace mineral, minerals and everything. And then ultimately just kept the region clean and kept trying to tuck it back in. And I was hoping that the muscle would strengthen enough to keep everything back in. Right. And after about 10 days, 
this scab, she, the scab got co- kind of big, but it actually protected the region. It was a great example of how nature can just protect itself in so many different right. ways. So this scab protected her well enough to kind of keep the region from becoming infected. Her own body did this. And yeah, then yeah. once the scab was able to pop off, then everything tucked back in. It was incredible. And That's she's all. been laying normally since then. Absolutely. Yep. She's perfectly fine now. And then it took another two and a half, maybe three weeks to migrate her with my flock. Mm -hmm. And um, now she's just, you know, one of the flock and it's great to have her around and she's a little special connection because we basically saved her life. So that's Uno. So that's, that's one way that, you know, of, of how I, you know, cared for a chicken. We touched on this a little bit, but what really inspired you to take up this profession? I've always had a dream of working with animals in one way or another, Mm -hmm. but one particular situation really springboarded me into becoming an animal health practitioner. And I talked about maybe raising dogs or maybe training dogs, but the practitioner status came when in 2009, actually on Christmas night, I had this three-year-old American bulldog that was diagnosed with heart failure. Oh, and it was, it was an emergency situation. Christmas day, we woke up to celebrate the day, but we noticed this little cough and she just, you could tell that she wasn't doing well that day. And the cough progressed as the day went on. And it was that evening. We said, you know what, we've got to take her into the emergency and see what's going on. And they came back with the x-rays and they said, her heart is as big as a football and she's got less than six months to live. Oh, wow. and it was That's so awful. Oh, it was just crushing, you know, and this was, you know, at the time we didn't have any children. She was basically our only child Mm -hmm. and um, it just crushed us. So we said, let's do whatever we can to try and save her life. So we took her to a cardiac specialist and they didn't give us any more news that would say that she was going to live longer. So we kind of were coming to that point where we go, okay, she's got six months. But then what happened was down the road from us, there was a, a holistic vet. And we say, you know, holistic vet, what does that even mean? You know what I mean? Right. So we went to go see him and talk to him. Maybe he can provide us a little bit um, of different protocol or whatnot. And then he started right. asking us questions like I was talking about earlier, you know, um, lifestyle and what's her diet. So he kind of turned us on to having a more holistic mindset when it came to animal care. And so we changed her diet and we added some supplementation and we did everything that we could, but unfortunately she did pass away. But from there, I said, you know what, I'm doing things differently. I had her on kibble and, you know, it was a, it was a very expensive kibble and I thought it was the best thing that I could possibly do for her, not even knowing anything about a raw diet or a home prepared diet or anything else until I talked to him and I realized, wow, there was a lot more that I could have been doing. Not to say that that would have changed anything because it was hereditary, but I realized, you know what, I can do better for my animals. And so then I just started to take a natural approach with my animals. And, you know, from there on, when this, like I said, from when this program presented itself, I said, this is it, you know, this is a chance for me to up-level myself and go practitioner status and start caring for animals professionally. You know, that's where the passion really came from is losing her and saying, you know what, I want to do better for my own animals. And then Mm -hmm. also I want to take it up a notch and help other people do better for theirs. You know, becoming an animal health practitioner is really, you know, ultimately a dream come true in a sense, but we're not done yet. So our next mission is to start the Garcia Sanctuario, where we actually want to um, buy a piece of property here in New Zealand and become an animal rescue and animal health care nice. clinic. We'll have so to that's, come visit you. <laughs> absolutely. You know, we're going to make it somewhat of a, a scene where people can come and visit the animals as well. And I've been inspired by a couple of people in the region that have their sanctuary. And I said, this is what I want to do. Plus, I can provide the holistic health care for these animals. So you know, there's a lot of animals that need rescuing and a lot of chickens here in New Zealand, actually. Yeah. New Zealand is known for its agriculture, but that doesn't mean that it's always done properly. One rescue up the way, I mean, she's constantly, it seems like every year rescuing 4,000 birds, always trying to find homes. So, you know, I want to do my part and contribute as yeah. well. Well, that is amazing. And we will definitely be following you along on that journey. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You know, we had a quick question and we're just going to throw it out there because we were curious. Acupuncture. Have you used that on any patients? 
So I am not trained, but I do promote it for sure. At the same time with my consultations, I'll sub out. Maybe it's chiropractic care. Maybe it's acupuncture. You know, maybe we need to get the nutritionist involved a little bit, but yeah, acupuncture is great. If you can get the animal to kind of take to it, it can be phenomenal. We had someone asking us about chickens Mm -hmm. and acupuncture. So we were like, well, we'll check with Andy and see what he does. Yeah. I mean, I know horses that have had it to great effect. So yeah, I can't imagine that it wouldn't help. Exactly. Absolutely. So that leads us to our wrap up question. What led you to start your podcast? It is an excellent podcast. We've both been listening. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Path less followed. So ultimately this was just an inspiration to try and speak to as many people that took somewhat of an alternative lifestyle, more of maybe a holistic approach or kind of did things different against the norm somewhat, and then ultimately learn from them. So it's, it's, I'm a little bit greedy with my podcast (laughs) because ultimately I just interview people so I can learn from them. But at the (laughs) same time, we're able to share this through the podcasting format nowadays. So other people can learn as well. Yeah. that's where the inspiration came from. You know, I wanted to talk to um, pet nutritionists or I wanted to talk to coffee with the chicken ladies to see what what kind of tips I could get from, you know, raising my own chickens, you know, so just talk to people with different walks of life that are taking somewhat of a a different or alternative approach to life and then ultimately learn from them. But right now it's, I'm kind of going down the route of just this having conversations with people more within the, um, you know, the animal scene. Everyone should listen to Andy's podcast. It's really good. Yeah, it's fantastic. It really is. And the guests that you've had on have been so good and interesting. I'm doing stuff around the farm, listening to it. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely worth a listen. Just a little sneak peek. I just had a conversation with a lady that is a dog yoga instructor and calls it Doga. Nice. Nice. (laughs) Teaches you the benefits of doing yoga with your dog. And it's phenomenal. It wasn't what I expected at all, but it was incredible. Wow. So anyways, that episode will be coming soon. Fantastic. Aww. I will link Andy's podcast in our show notes. So yes, everyone check it find out. It. Yep. We're going to say goodbye to Andy for today. And thank you. Thank you so much. You've become a friend through all of this. Um, Absolutely. For joining us on our podcast and listen to Andy's episode. You'll hear us. Yes. We're on there. We're on there. Yep. We're on Absolutely. there. And follow him on Instagram. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing your um, your breakdown on the brown shaver as well. <laughs> it's good stuff. We have some good history on the brown shaver, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So we're going to say bye to Andy. And thank you so much again for joining us at our table all the way from New Zealand. Until next time. See you later. Bye, everyone. Okay, so it's time for... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. And this week, we're keeping with New Zealand. We are. We found a really, really neat recipe. It's very different. This one is New Zealand-style egg and bacon pie. Yeah. And it's not a quiche. It's very different than a quiche. It's so different. And we just wanted to keep everything New New Zealand. Zealand. That's right. So the egg and bacon pie, when they say bacon... They're not talking about streaky bacon that we have here in the U.S. Okay. They're talking about Irish-style bacon or rashers. I'm not familiar with that. So if you're in the U.K., it's more like a slice of ham. Okay. But it's bacon. Is it so, thick? It's on the thicker side, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not It's not like a ham steak or something, but it's a little thicker. Okay. I'd say in the U.S., if you can't source some kind of rasher, I would use Canadian bacon. Okay, like the round kind of right, bacon. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Actually, I would not use Canadian bacon. I would probably use a vegan bacon. I was going to say, yeah. The problem with those is a lot of them are not gluten-free, so you have to look carefully. If I couldn't find something I liked, I might use mushrooms. You could use mushrooms, or we actually saw the coconut bacon. Coconut bacon's interesting, but I think you want something heavier than that. Heavier. That's like chips. Oh, okay. So you want eight or ten eggs. Okay. And I put the range in there because it depends on how many eggs you want. Let's back up just a second, though, and talk about the crust. The crust, okay. Because you know where I would go with the crust. You would buy it. (laughs) Which is fine. You can buy it. I would make a double crust. Because you want to do it gluten dairy free. Not because I like my own crust. You do. Yeah. I mean, you're the baker, so. It doesn't, I mean, either way, it it should work for you if you get a a really good quality. I do it both ways. Uh I know you've made crust before. Yeah. So you get your bottom crust rolled out. Okay. Set your crust aside. You're going to saute your onions, carrots, and peas together. Season them the way you like. Right. You set those aside. You have your pie crust ready to go. Yes. 
Then you're going to break your eggs into the pie. Okay. How many should you break it? Four or five. I put eight to ten on the recipe. Okay. Um, I like more eggs in there rather yeah. than less. Oh, yeah. So I did five. Yeah. You break them open and, and drop them in as if you're putting them in a mixing bowl. Right. But you don't do anything with them. You try That's not different to right the there. Egg. It's very different. So you have these five raw eggs in the right. bottom of your pie crust. You layer your bacon or whatever you're using on to- over top of that. Okay. Without breaking the yolks. Exactly. So just gently place it over. Then you place your vegetables on top. That you've cooked. Exactly. All your cooked vegetables on top. Then you do the next to the last layer, which is more eggs. Four to five more eggs, exactly. And you can either swirl the yolks a little bit. Yeah, you can. Or, or you can keep them it. intact. Exactly. At this point, I'd be tempted to sprinkle a little bit of green bean. onion, maybe. Green onion could be good. I was thinking about fake cheese, but fake cheese. cheese. Well, I, I eat fake cheese. So. Yeah, vegan cheese or regular cheese. Or regular cheese. And then you put your top crust on. And then you bake it. For bake about it. an hour. At 350? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Just like almost exactly the way you would a sweet pie, but it's a savory pie. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a different turn on eggs. I'll tell you what, it's really good. Yeah. This is one that you can get the family going with yeah. and surprise them with. Right. We're going to have a New Zealand night. Yeah. You know, and talk about brown shavers <laughs> <laughs> and eat the New Zealand egg and bacon pie. I was so intrigued by this way of eating eggs in New Zealand. I had to try it right away and it's delicious. Yeah, it's a really, really good recipe. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. If you want to do around the world, we do that sometimes. You're like, one night of the week, you're going to have Mexican. One night of the week, you're going to have Italian. One night of the week, add New Zealand. (laughs) And if you have a dozen eggs to use, this doesn't hurt. This is what we're saying. We're in egg season. Oh, yes, we are. This is more of like, I would say, a Sunday morning breakfast or... I like this for dinner. I like it for dinner, too. Or lunch. With and if you're not gluten-free or if you are, you could do biscuits with it. You could, yeah. You could do a lot of different variations with it to add a little bit. Or you could just make the pie and say, hey, everybody, here you go. It's different. And that's the thing I like about it. Oh, yeah. It's really unusual. It's a different way to cook your eggs. It so is. you're not getting so bored. Right. And this is some of the things we try to talk about egg recipes is so that you can think of different ways to make them because you're going to have so many of them. So many of them. So many eggs at this time of the year. Right. And you got to think of different ways to prepare them so you're not tired of them. I mean, this does kill off close to a dozen eggs. Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. And it's really delicious and it's super fun. You know what would be good with it? A green salad for dinner. That's how I liked it. I put salad on the side, a slice of the pie. It was. It's really, really yeah. good. You can do salad with this. You can do a lot of different things. So you could even do some hash browns. I suppose you could. You could. You could what? chop up potatoes. Yeah, you could. And cook them and then put them in too. You could. Yeah. You could do this any way you want. I just I'd think like it's sweet neat. potatoes in there, I think. Oh, that would be good. Yeah, that would be really You could good. do that with curry. Yes. Ooh, that sounds good. Like the sweet potatoes and curry kind of go together. They can, yeah. So there's different variations, but hey, New Zealand, this is the way they make their bacon and egg pie. We loved it. We loved it. So try it. Yeah. We can't tell you enough. If you're trying these recipes, share the pictures with us. We want to see them. We will give you a story. And it really is great. So that leads us to let's tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week. Well, next week is our special 4th of July episode. Yay! I love the 4th of July. It's fun. Growing up, we always got together at my grandparents' house for 4th of July, and I have fond memories of yeah. being with my cousins. I always liked it when I was younger, too. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about historical chicken breeds. And American historical American chicken historical breeds. American historical chicken breeds. And we have two special guests. Yes. We're going to be talking to Lisa Pregent, the livestock manager at Mount Vernon, George Washington's Mount Vernon. One of our most favorite places. And we are going to be talking to Charlene Couch from the Livestock Conservancy. Yes, we cannot wait. And we're going to be talking all about colonial chickens. We are. Our crack in the eggs is corn fritters adapted from Martha Washington's corn fritter recipe. Yes. Retail therapy, we're going to be talking about, it's essentially a book review, Dining with the Washingtons. Yeah. And we've been posting that we've been at Mount Vernon a lot. It's one of our favorite places. It really is. We're an hour and a half away and we love chickens of colonial times and the Washington mansion and farm had a lot of chickens. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. So we're going to talk about having animals in the historic estates and we're going to talk about what breeds you would have found. Yeah. It's going to be so much fun. Yes. You'll have to look on Instagram for all of our pictures and videos that are going to go alongside it. Right. Okay. So before we go, what should we tell everybody? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. 
If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.